The following podcast is a Sempronto Media production. Hey guys, welcome to today's episode. And we have Jeff Wu, and we are going to be talking about exogenous ketones, nootropics, extended fasting, and more. So welcome, Jeff. Tell listeners a little bit about yourself. Well, thank you for having me on the program. Uh, I'm a computer scientist by background, studied computer science at Stanford, and my journey into metabolism, health, fasting came in around 2013, 2014, where I saw that my smartest friends at Stanford were thinking about making computers better, making, you know, people click more ads through Facebook and building all these sorts of technical uh, information technology things. And I thought, well, we're all humans. Why aren't more smart people thinking about making humans better? And that got me deep into the sort of Silicon Valley biohacking community uh, and the high-end physiological sports science world dealing with elite athletes. And it's been a really fun journey over the five, last six, almost seven years now, really not only working with and collaborating and publishing research with some of the top academics in the space, but also being a personal guinea pig, trying all sorts of things like exogenous ketones, ketone esters, nootropics, and all the things that you, you just described. So can speak towards what's happening at the bleeding edge of academia, as well as what's happening in the field with athletes and military and, 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 and the crazy experimentalists, as well as um, speaking from personal basis, talking and being in this space for the last, you know, six, seven years. Awesome. Okay. So let's talk about nootropics. First of all, for people who have never heard that term, what is it? And tell us more. Nootropics, nootropics, uh, sort of an umbrella buzzword term that describes a class of compounds, supplements, foods that enhance some aspect of cognition. So what does that mean specifically? So what are some aspects of cognition? Well, there's reaction time, there's short-term memory, there's working memory. Uh, there's all these attributes of measuring intelligence or cognition that you can break down into a very quantitative metric, right? Your reaction time can be you know, 0.5 seconds versus 0.3 seconds, right? Like very elite baseball players have shorter reaction time because they can detect that fastball and, and actually connect with the ball. Um, these things can be improved through nootropics. Um, and they don't have to necessarily be super exotic research chemicals. A lot of people would describe caffeine, our daily cup of coffee, as a very basic standard nootropic where over 2 billion cups of coffee are consumed a day. Um, but there are more exotic research chemicals that have come from uh, research programs looking at Alzheimer's or uh, neurological conditions that are being translated into supplements or, or, or more consumer friendly forms. So, you know, from my background, I sort of entered into the space of human performance focused on the brain first. So nootropics was my initial foray into the human performance world, uh, especially being in Silicon Valley, where I like to describe the culture as uh, intellectual battlefield where people are competing with their brains. And I would say that most of the economy today, especially with, you know, the, the current pandemic, most of us have to almost translate the creative intellectual, uh, digital work. Right. I mean, just, just, I mean, the folks that have physical jobs, I, I think, I think our friends that are just struggling because it's, you can't really even, um, open up or, or go into the warehouse. So, at the time, it seemed very high leverage. If we can improve humanity's cognition by one or two percent and multiply that across billions of people, can we create a better, healthier, more productive society? Um, so, uh, you know, so we eventually started a company, uh, HVMN Health via Modern Nutrition, that started off selling some super solid nootropic stacks or combination of nootropics, and. Um, I, I, at the time, I thought it was going to be a little side project because I was uh, kind of a computer guy, internet uh, guy uh, by background. But within eight months of launching that business, we were doing 80000 a month in sales. And we're like, oh, man, this could be a real thing. And, and that was the catalyst that took me from kind of tinkerer, hobbyist into, hey, maybe I could build a career in this space. And what were some of the different blends of like what was inside of those blends that 
you know, obviously it provides energy and focus, improved memory. Yep. Right. Like that's what nootropics are, but like, what are, what are the things inside those? Um, like, is it, you know, ashwagandha, yeah. vitamin D, vitamin K, like what, what's inside and that makes you kind of take yourself to the next level. Yes. Yeah, so you mentioned ashwagandha, which actually has pretty robust RCT data behind it. So in our, our mainstay daily nootropic stack, we stack ashwagandha with bacopa maniri, which has really good data around neurogenesis and elevating BDNF, brain derived neurotrophic factor, which start, which creates new neurons. Um, some pretty solid RCT data on increasing working memory capacity in, uh, in humans, right? So we like to look at data that has shown effect in humans. There's a lot of animal data out there and oftentimes it doesn't translate. And the last component within RISE is CDB choline, which is a choline precursor, uh, which is the main building block for acetylcholine, which is a neurotransmitter associated with memory formation and learning. So that's one of our most popular stacks. Uh, you mentioned vitamin D and vitamin K. We actually have that within a stack called Kato, which is a super high omega-3 focus on DHA, which is important for uh, brain, membrane, uh, neuron health. And then we stack that with astaxanthin, which is a potent antioxidant with vitamin D and vitamin K. So a lot of these things synergize really well. So, so the particular reason why most people stack D and K together is that they work synergistically together. So you get benefits that surpass just one alone. And oftentimes you want to be taking that with fat for better absorption. Um, so, yeah. So, so basically it's like one should be thoughtful of not just the ingredients or components alone, but how they actually work together in, in, in the human system. So if you had to pick like three kind of vitamins or minerals that you would say that are like game changers, like if you said, you know, cause I think one of the things that happens, I know it happened to me, like, it's funny. Cause I'll just show you like right here. I'm like, yes, yeah, like literally, you know, you can get a little out of control, right? Like, I mean, when I tell you right on the side of my desk right here, I've got, probably 40 different um pill bottles that i yep. have and i kind of alternate you know i take this or take that um but if you had to kind of say like here's the three things that i feel like people are really missing like it's kind of like the game changer and if someone said look i'm not going to do this i'm not going to do that but this is the piece that people really need what would that be yeah um the way i would approach that question is I'll take it in a couple of different ways, which is that we are all pretty personally different in terms of our environmental factors, meaning that um, if you're to do this right, let's actually get blood biomarkers. Um, it, what is your vitamin D status, for example? What is your magnesium status? What is your zinc status? Um, I think to, in today's context where we really want to be enhancing immune function, I think the three basics that I would just generally not knowing any additional information about any individual person would be uh, zinc, vitamin D, and maybe magnesium. So I think I am choosing those because vitamin D and magnesium are oftentimes under uh, consumed in American population. Those are some of the highest efficiency rates. And uh, zinc shows some immune enhancing properties uh, vitamin D that's been really good associ associational data. If you have very low vitamin D status, you have worse outcomes from COVID and then, uh, magnesium it's generally an important mineral for sleep. And I think getting good sleep is important right now. So those would be some of like the three core basics that I would just say, like, you know, just from percentage of people that, uh, are likely underdosed in America. And these are pretty cheap available things, right? Like these are not as exotic as the nootropics that we are perhaps selling. Um, other things that make the honorable mention list, I would look at omega-3s. I think a lot in, of the American diet is very heavily weighted towards omega-6s. Um, so uh, a solid DHA EPA supplement would, would seem fairly wise. Um, 
and then I would start looking more on the nootropics front, things like Bacopa, ashwagandha, some of these things that really are, are, are useful for kind of on, on the performance edge side. So that would be kind of the order of operations. Like make sure you don't have deficiencies. Like that's kind of like the original role of supplements, right? Like it's hard to necessarily get enough magnesium zinc every single day. So let's just guarantee that with a, with a vitamin. Gotcha. And I saw on your site that you have, is it four different ones? You have one called Rise, one called Kato, one called Sprint, one called Yawn, right? Yep. Yep. And so, yeah. I saw on Rise, talk about the different things that are in that one and explain what they do for you. Yeah. So Rise, uh, it's a combination of ashwagandha, uh, Bacopa Minerity, and CDB choline. And Bacopa is one of the more robust bust botanicals that enhances neurogenesis and brain derived neurotrophic factor, which is important for uh, neuron production. And I, there's a really awesome uh, study in humans in an RCT showing improved working memory capacity compared to placebo. So solid data in terms of enhancing uh, working memory. Uh, ashwagandha is a uh, really potent and versatile adaptogen and we like ashwagandha in terms of the reduction of cortisol and reducing stress. And then CDB choline, uh, as, as we briefly touched upon, it's a choline, acetylcholine precursor, which is the neurotransmitter for memory and learning. And CDB choline has uh, independently has one of the better collections of data around improving different aspects of cognition in RCTs. So, uh, Overall, we see that as a really good package of some of the most like well-evidenced, robust, uh, daily use nootropics that, that, are, that are safe and have strong evidence behind. Let's talk about the blood sugar levels. I hear people all the time talk about fasting and they're like, I can't fast because my blood sugar levels get wonky. Um, and so that's a big kind of, it's an excuse, right? So I want you to talk about that. And I want you to talk about the continuous blood glucose monitor and what your opinion on that is. Yeah, that's a good, um, that just reminds me of like a lot of the conversations I had with my mom when I first started fasting like five, six years ago, because I think we're so uh, culturally ingrained, like three square meals a day, have a snack, you know, constantly like never go hungry. Um, so when people say, Hey, my blood sugar goes wonky when you fast, I can't do it. Well, that's actually expected behavior, especially if you're used to constant consumption of food. So, and, and this is actually validated if you actually measure this yourself, uh, with something like a continuous glucose monitor. So the challenge when someone starts first starts fasting is that, uh, your the body is so used to constant boluses or injections of carbohydrate or sugar all the time. So it ends up building some insulin resistance and expectation to have that, that much energy coming all the time. When you take that away, your body's like first has an adaptation period to realize, oh, there's no exogenous sugar, exogenous glucose. We have to start ramping up production of our own stored glucose. And that's actually stored in the liver in the form called the glycogen. And we store about 24 hours of glycogen in that, in, in our liver. Uh, as we start fasting longer and longer, we, we deplete all of our glycogen reserves. Well, what happens after we run out of stored glycogen in 18, 24 hours? Do we just die? No, we have our fat reserves. And even the most lean of us have tens of pounds of fat. And the evolutionary purpose of fat is literally stored energy. Um, and prehistoric man and woman were able to readily convert that fat stores into usable energy in the form of ketones. But because in the modern context, we never actually have to dip into our energy reserves, reserves, we never actually go through the process of ketosis and all the enzymes and all the metabolic pathways that control ketosis are really, really downregulated or really, really, I guess, out of shape. So that's what happens when people start fasting for the first few times. You feel crappy because your body, it's like 
you're, you're, you're asking your body to do a marathon. If you've been on the couch, like, yeah, it, it, it sucks. Cause like you just didn't exercise those metabolic pathways. And when I first started fasting, I, I, I did pretty aggressive fast to begin. We were doing 60 hour fast. So we would stop eating Sunday night and have breakfast Wednesday morning. We were just kind of hardcore. Like that's, uh, we were reading some of, uh, some of the longevity studies associated with fasting. And yeah, I, like the first month of doing that. And so we do it once a week, we're crappy, like felt bad, but at, uh, third, fourth time fasting, your, my body got adapted to it and it just felt actually really refreshing and really clear to do these longer fasts. And, uh, that's very consistent through literature. And I think people call this the keto flu or keto adaptation, where it just takes your body a little bit of time to get used to fasting or going to ketosis, uh, and, 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 and training your body outside of like the standard American diet, the sad diet that we're so constantly used to. I mean, I mean, I think a lot of people can say if you, if we were scientists trying to engineer a diet to give you metabolic syndrome and give like induce obesity. And this is like literally what uh, people feed lab rats to induce obesity. You do high fat, high carb diets. And that's essentially what the standard American diet looks like. And that's like clinically what people do to rats to make them fat. So that we're, we're just doing that to ourselves. Mm, and then to touch upon uh, the CGM point, uh, continuous glucose monitor, um, these have been around for quite some time for type one diabetics, right? Because for diabetics, you really need to control your blood sugar levels. If you're too low, you don't have ketones, dangerous, right? If it's too high, dangerous. So they need to control their blood sugar. So this was like a medical device, but biohackers, um, I started playing around with them four or five years ago. And these are actually, actually have one, mm -hmm. um, you know, they, you know, they can look like something like this where it's a little disc that you imprint into your arm and it just sticks in there for two weeks at a time. And you can see your blood sugar in real time evolve when you drink a soda, when you eat an apple, when you eat a steak, you can actually see in real time how your body responds to that food source. And there was a really one more time, if you don't mind, when was the last time that you, you used one? Um, probably, uh, a year ago at this time. So four or five years ago, I was probably half the year I was wearing them and I just got a really good baseline of, um, how I respond to certain foods. Now it's very sporadic in terms of when I want to do an experiment. Um, so I'm playing, I'm potentially playing around with some experiments of new diets, new foods, and, uh, it, it's always valuable to confirm your intuition of your subjective feeling of feeling clear with like real data on, on blood sugar. Hey guys, I wanted to tell you I'm offering a free weight loss virtual Bible study. Now is the perfect time to focus on understanding true hunger and fullness and learn what the Bible has to say about it. All you have to do is go to ChantelRayWay.com slash Bible study. After you sign up, you'll receive a six week Bible study video that you can watch on your own or you can get a small group of people and do it together. That's ChantelRayWay.com slash Bible study for your free six week Bible study course. So let's talk about that because so I actually probably maybe two years ago, I bought a continuous glucose blood monitor and it was expensive. It was yep. actually like I leased it and I think it was between four, maybe 450 for the month. So I yep. got it or maybe it was three weeks. I can't remember. But let's say they gave it to me for a month. They literally shipped it to me. They walked me through how to use it. And I, you know, I put it in, but they had me calibrate it twice a day. So because I was thinking, well, this you know, the whole thing about continuous blood glucose monitor is that you don't, you save on, you know, not having to prick your finger, yeah. prick your finger and test yeah. it. But I only eat twice a day, which I wanted to kind of check it. And one of the things that was very interesting to me that I found was that when I was having that continuous blood glucose monitor, at that time, I was really doing a lot of 
a coffee with MCT oil because I wanted to, em- yep. to experiment with it. And what I realized was, and I, and I used it when I was fasting, I was doing like a two or three day fast, but I was still doing some MCT oil with coffee. And one of the interesting things was my blood glucose was right around the 80 mark for most of the time. Every once in a while, it would kind of drop lower depending on like if I was walking or working out. But every time I had coffee with coconut oil or coffee with MCT oil, instantly my blood glucose would drop by 10. So let's say it was at 80. I would drink that cup and it would go down 10. I would be at 70 and it would drop eight points. Um, Or if I was at you know, 85, it dropped to 75, wherever I was at it instantly, it would drop eight to 10 points. So, um, talk about both of those things. So one is like that one that you just showed, you can show it again. Where did you buy that from? How much was it? Um, and you know, do, do you have to calibrate it all with that? Yeah. Uh, so, there's two main companies that make CGMs. One is Abbott Labs, and this is one from Abbott. It's called the Freestyle Libre. And there's also one from Dexcom, uh, which is a little bit more expensive. Now, that might be the one that you were uh, experimenting with. Um, in the United States, you, are, you need a doctor's prescription to get access to these. These are you know, low-grade medical devices. That said, you one could find some of these things uh, through the interwebs. Um, and uh, for example, in the in Europe, these are uh, these are more OTC or over the counter. So one can acquire these things, um, ranging from you know one hundred to a couple hundred bucks for like a two week tracking period. So still more, still decently expensive. Um, I recently invested in a company called Levels. I, I believe their website is unlocklevels.com that uh, wraps a telemedicine platform. So they actually have, you talk to a doctor, the doctor prescribes you and they have some really cool software that tracks uh, your CGM. So that might be a really good uh, uh, platform to access CGMs in like a 100% validated safe way. Um, but in terms of, you know, it's kind of a practical device uh, find a service like levels or just talk to your primary care practitioner. Um, ask, tell them that, Hey, I'm worried about my metabolism. Um, I, I, I want to understand and potentially most prevent doctor, prediabetes. Think, and yeah. And I think, yeah, yeah I mean, most doctors, yeah. Yeah. But, yeah. So, yeah. So it sounds like, it's not like, it's not like something like super invasive, right? You're not asking for, you know, opioids or, or, or something. You're asking for something that's literally like, Hey, I am, you are sensible to spend your own money on something that's like definitely not required, especially if you don't have like an, you know, type one diabetes to optimize your health better. So it seems pretty low risk to me. So um, you said Dexcom was one the, to say the name of the other one that you were talking about. Uh, so yeah, this, this freestyle Libre is uh-huh. from Abbott, A-B-B-O-T-T um, and are Dexcom. You- yeah. Which one's the one you're partners with? Uh, I've mainly used Freestyle Libres. I haven't tried a Dexcom before. And uh, there was another one, another website called Up or something. Uh, so the the company that that helps connect you with a doctor to help prescribe uh, Freestyle Libre is called Levels Unlock Levels. Oh, Unlock Levels. Gotcha. Got it. Um, but they just they're the ones that just subs- help you get to a doctor that will help you get that. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. It's like a fully integrated platform. So it's like a telemedicine platform. Um, essentially they wrap like the doctor, the prescription, the delivery of CGM all in a really tight service. And they built some really awesome software to, 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 to like it, it, which is like a better piece of software than what Abbott or Dexcom usually have just kind of out of the box. And that's unlocklevels.com. Yeah. Got it. Okay. So explain a little bit when, when I was saying to you that I did that continuous blood glucose and I was noticing that when I took that, the 
the coconut oil or the MCT, my blood sugar dropped significantly. Yep. Talk about what's going on in your body. And is that true that that does happen? Is that just me or is that multiple people and what's actually happening in your body? Yeah. Great observation. And, and, and that's what is cool about CGMs. Cause like you're literally just seeing scientific data awesome. like uh, real time. So that's actually consistent with literature. So what's happening is that MCT or coconut. So MCT stands for medium chain triglyceride. And, uh, these are fats that readily convert into ketones. Now, as we described a little bit before, our body primarily in the standard American diet is used to using sugar as its fuel. But as you do fasting, as you go into ketosis, your body shifts its fuel source away from carbs, away from glucose into fats and ketones. And MCTs are really popular because they're the most ketogenic fat. So they convert into ketones the most quickly. So when you're consuming MCT or even exogenous ketones, you're essentially reducing the need of glucose because you have an increase in ketones. So if you're actually measuring your ketone levels at the same time you're measuring your glucose, I would expect your ketones to rise and your glucose to drop. So that's what you're seeing. So you overall have the same overall energy that your brain and your body is utilizing but the ratio is different. You're just in, you're consuming and, and you're utilizing more ketones than glucose. So that's been an interesting observation. And that's why a lot of people are looking at a low carb strategy or using MCT oils to uh, help with their uh, pre-diabetes or metabolic syndrome or ketogenic strategies for a number of health uh, basic therapeutic applications as well as like performance applications. So, yeah, I, I think that's like one of the cool observations that yeah, you see these, like these markers are quite fluid. Um, if you, for example, uh, do a heavy, heavy anaerobic workout, if you're just lifting weights, squatting, bench press, you'll see your blood sugar rise because your, uh, your liver is like, Oh wow, we're using We need a lot of sugar to do anaerobic activity. So your body compensates. If you're in a hot sauna, for example, oftentimes people see blood sugar rise and then, and then afterwards drop like and, and, and study out. But in terms of like the blood uh, sugar levels that you're describing, like 80, 85, that's super solid. So congrats on having a, a, a really nice fasted blood glucose range. Thank you. And just so you know, before I started doing intermittent fasting, I would wake up in the morning and take my blood sugar and I was between 99 and 102 in a fasted right when I woke up. Yeah, so I was when I was eating all the time, you know, yeah. whatever. I started doing intermittent fasting and now I'm really steady right in that 80 range and that's where I my blood sugar stays unless I eat and then obviously yeah. it goes up but in a fasted state I'm somewhere in the 70 to 80 range. Yeah. And that's exactly where you want to be. And I mean, it sounds like you were right at the border of what's considered pre-diabetes. So when, um, you know, you go to the doctor and this is like literally the algorithm that they'll use to basically diagnose if it's over a hundred fasted, that's starting to go in the range of pre-diabetes. And then clinically, if you fasted at over 120, that's a pretty clear, I mean, that, that is a trigger for type two diabetes. So yeah, essentially lower the better, but like you're never going to get to zero. So I, I think when people like uh, think about, I think people go pretty extreme, like sugar is not evil. Like it's a very useful fuel source and there always needs to be some sugar or glucose for different cells in our body. And, and, and uh, so that's why it's, you know, our body stores so much of it. Uh, but I think the problem in, again, standard American diet and our culture now is that we just over consume like by like orders of magnitude, then, uh, you're, you know, we're pumping jet fuel into like, a, a like a, like a Prius and it's like, stop putting in more fuel. Yeah. All right. So what about exogenous ketones? Can you tell us what they are and how to use them? Yeah. So exogenous ketones are a relatively new technology that has entered the nutritional world. So, as we described, um, when you do fasting or when you go on a ketogenic diet and when you eat 
uh, consume MCTs or coconut oil, we're consuming fat or reducing our carbohydrate uh, load in order to produce our own ketones. Um, so MCTs are kind of like the interim or the, or like the baby step into exogenous ketones in the sense that they're not directly ketones, but they're just one step before a ketone. So what if you could just eat ketones directly? And that's what exogenous ketones are. So these are molecules, mostly fermented through chemical, like, like bio reactors or through chemical synthesis. Um, you can create these ketones that are consumable, safe to consume, and rapidly raises your ketone levels. And a lot of the applications for uh, these exogenous ketones are related to high-end performance. So a lot of athletes, uh, a lot of military applications, a lot of high-performing executives are experiment experimenting with exogenous ketones, ketone esters, ketone salts to, uh, to basically have like ketones on demand. So it's a cool way to not have to fast or be super strict on the ketogenic diet and get ketosis into your system. Hey guys, one of the things that will take your weight loss to the next level is coaching. You can either work one-on-one -on -one with me or one of our certified private coaches. If you'd like, you can schedule your free call. It's a 10 minute strategy call just to see if coaching is gonna really take you to the next level. Don't just take my word for it. Listen to this recent review, a happy coaching client sent in. Thanks so much for your help and guidance. I never could have done it without you. The other thing is listening to the audiobook. Listening to the audiobook and getting the video course that I've done, people are seeing dramatic results. If you just listen to the audiobook 30 minutes a day, over and over and over again, and get the video course, go to ChantelRayway.com and check out the video course. You won't be sorry you did. Um, so talk about what you like pros and cons of this so like what i want you to say okay here's the few pros but here's some cons yeah so the pros of exogenous ketones are that this is a super efficient metabolic switch essentially you can very rapidly switch your metabolism from glucose to ketones and that has performance applications for cognitive performance has implications for endurance performance for uh, athletes. So over the last couple of Tour de France's, we supplied about a third to half of all the Tour de France teams. Um, uh, we work with NFL, NBA, MMA fighters. So like just from in terms of just getting uh, efficiency from performance, you can have this new novel physiological state where you can have the presence of ketones and glucose at the same time which is not normally achievable if you fast or eat a ketogenic diet. So there's a lot of cool research applications by being able to metabolic switch really quickly and be able to dual fuel uh, at the same time. The cons are, well, they are, should not be thought of as like a magic, like juice, right? Like ketones are a calorie containing substance. They're an energy source. And, um, you basically like because you eat like a crappy diet and do sprinkle ketones on top, that's not going to resolve all the sins of, of, of everything else you ingested. So uh, use this as a tool, not as a, like a crutch or something to like to pay off your sins or so something like that. So like, I think it's like, I'm just thinking of the word uh, or like the, yeah. If you like you're in uh, the Catholic church and you, you pay like money to like get your sins removed. Um, it's not something like that. Awesome. Okay. I've got a couple of listener questions that I'd like to ask you. Awesome. Uh, this one's from Kelly and Kelly Anderson in Sugarland, Texas. Chantel, I love your podcast and I feel like I'm just like you. One thing I love when you talk about is how you have issues with your thyroid and you have constipation issues. <laughs> I am always constipated and the more I shorten my eating window, the more constipated I get. I'm still having trouble with my thyroid and constipation. Anything you think that will help? Kelly Anderson, Sugarland, Texas. Yeah. Um, so 
I think one would be, I'd be curious to learn what kind of fiber intake she is taking and what kind of, what is her diet composition? Um, there's been an interesting debate in kind of nutrition Twitter or in like kind of the, the nerds of nutrition, whether dietary fiber helps or uh, makes worse constipation type issues, because one, it's not clear that it's required. And I've, and, and, and I've, I've personal experience there by like going on a carnivore diet, which is just like straight. I was just eating only animal products. So I get literally got like zero dietary fiber and my bowel movements are, were very, very normal. So that just showed me personally, as well as reflecting the literature that, you know, this, this notion of eat a bunch of fiber and then that resolves your constipation might work for some types of constipation, but not all types of constipation. So without knowing kind of what her dietary composition is, I would say like, look at your fluid intake, make sure you're hydrating enough. And then to um, look at your dietary fiber intake and maybe experiment with there. Uh, I would try either ramping up on fiber or just completely removing fiber and seeing if that uh, affects uh, uh, your, your gut. Got it. All right. This next one's from Amanda. I'm writing because I saw a podcast episode somewhere in yours about whether we should be keeping track of the hours we are eating or the hours we are not eating in intermittent fasting. Create a beautiful day, Amanda. Uh, yeah, I, I think it's uh, choose your own flavor in the sense that they're inverses of each other. Um, I would say that uh, probably easier to keep track of how long you're fasting. Um, that's, that seems to be making it a proactive mindset versus a defensive mindset in terms of like a, hitting a goal versus like, oh, you know, counting the, time, the hours you're eating. Um, but again, there we have 24 hours in a day and you can either count there. It's going to be 24 minus X where X is whichever one you're counting to get to the other one. So equivalent in terms of information, uh, I think it's all just a mindset and, and, and how to play that internal game in terms of accomplishing your goal. So I would say, Hey, probably count the fasting hours just because you can kind of tick up the numbers. And that probably seems more accomplished. Uh, it gives you more of a sense of accomplishment versus like ticking, uh, like counting your eating hours, which is, again, I think we all want to get bigger numbers just, subjectively. So why not do a bigger numbers for fasting? And I think for me personally, I like to keep track of the hours I'm eating when it's on a daily basis. So meaning if it's in a 24 hour period, if I'm eating in a six hour window, I pretty much every day eat in a six hour window. Sometimes I eat in a one hour window, um, but I do it based on, okay, I'm eating in a six hour window or a one hour window. But then if it goes longer than 24 hours, then I track it based on the number of hours I'm fasting. Make sense? Yep, so I like, like that. I, that's what I, I, I was just going to interject and say, like, that's actually what I personally do. Same thing, yeah. actually. Yeah, I think that's actually smart. Like, I have a pretty a similar eating window as you, like, six to eight hour eating window, more towards a six, like six. And I think it's, yeah, you just think like, okay, I have my first meal at 2 p.m. I make sure I don't eat anything you know, start dinner at seven, wrap up by eight, and that's six hours. I think that's that's much more uh, easy to, to absorb. Yeah, 100%. it's easy to remember because then I'm like, wait, is it 16? Is it 18? But whenever I go longer than that, then I go, okay, wait a second. How long have I been fasted for? Is it been 48 hours? Is it 72 hours? Is it 60 hours? That's when I start tracking it the other way. I agree. Yep. I think that's nicely. Yeah, I agree. Nicely stated. Okay, well, let, tell listeners where they can find you, where they can follow you, and where they can get your amazing products. Yes, so I'm active on social, uh, at Jeffrey Wu, G-E-O-F-F-R-E-Y-W-O-O, on mainly Twitter and Instagram. I actually have my own podcast and would potentially love to have you on, uh, yep, the HVMN Health Via Modern Nutrition Podcast. Uh, we have over 4 million downloads, so uh, a pretty fun community. We we go pretty deep in the nerdy side of metabolism and performance and our uh, company where you can find our MCT, our collagen 
and our exogenous ketone products can be found at hvmn.com. Awesome. Well, thanks so much. And remember, if you have a question, if you go to questions at chantelrayway.com, we'll see you next time. Thanks for joining. All right, joining. Chantel. Pleasure. Thank you. Bye. This has been a Sempronto Media Production. 